right, with the kids leaving, we're going to get into the Word of God this morning, and today is a day for children and for families. So today the message is on parenting, which fits into our series on choosing to be a healthy family. And uh, today we're going to be in Genesis looking at Isaac and Rebecca. And I uh, just want to come back to the news that we shared earlier, how exciting it is. For th- over three years, we've been in talks with this uh, seller. Uh, it, it really is a God thing because the seller has never put the property on the market. They actually contacted us three years ago by email and said that they wanted us to know that they were thinking of selling. And there were some really high moments where we thought maybe it would happen sooner. And then there were some low moments where we kind of just thought, it's not going to happen. But uh, everything has to happen in God's timing. And so we are just so excited as a finance team, as elders, as the future facility team to share with you. And by the way, all the team members are in unanimity over this decision. And so as Ben said earlier, let me remind you that uh, we have given today two-week notice. Uh, In two weeks, on the 27th, uh, we will close our service on Sunday morning and then 30 minutes after. Those who are members of this fellowship, you signed the fellowship covenant, uh, you are allowed to uh, vote and to speak in that meeting. And others can come and sit in the back if you'd like and observe it, but you're not able to participate if you haven't signed Fellowship Covenant, uh, because it is a, an act of the business of this fellowship, and that's what's in the bylaws. So we're just trying to, uh, to follow our bylaws there. But uh, exciting news, and if you want to drive out, it, people might ask, well, where is it located? Well, if you were to take from 58th Avenue and State Road 60, you know what the corner I'm speaking of. You've got a Walgreens, a CVS, a Wells Fargo, and a Burger King. That intersection and go straight to Storm Grove Middle School at 6.4 miles. If you were to go from there to the new location of our church, it's 3.3 miles. So praise God, it's a little closer. Amen. Um, But it's also out west a little ways, which we see as a positive. And uh, because uh, Vero's moving west. So for the long-term future of our church, we feel like we're going to be in a really good position. So we're excited about it. Next week, next week, Uh, We will have uh, other members of the team who will be here, and so I'll share a little more information, show some pictures, but you can ride out and take a look. Just don't go in. Don't try to go in. Hey, we're buying your place, so we're here to (laughs) check things out. Uh, Currently in the building, there is a ton of video production equipment for the church that's out there. They have an internet church, and so it's, it's, it, we can't even take pictures inside because it's just all filling the place. So that'll be gone. Uh, they do have studios out there inside that they built, and they're going to tear those down. So we'll have a, a, a wonderful canvas to, to draw up what God wants us to do with that building. But it was a church originally built as a Catholic church, or a Catholic church built it. And uh, later on, it became the Knights of Columbus and the Bingo Hall. <laughs> and so... We're reclaiming for the Lord, amen, a building that uh, was built. That's good. All right, that's enough. I don't want to share any more, but uh, it's very exciting. I hope that you will share in this endeavor. And let me tell you, it will be a a step of faith. Anytime you do something that the Lord's leading, he will make sure faith is involved. Is that not true? Okay, in fact, one of the places that we all understand, those of us who serve as parents, uh, that is a step of faith to be a parent. Am I not not correct in that? And so this will be just like that. But anyway, let's get to our text and let's start with a word of prayer. Father, today, what a a glorious day it is. You you have allowed Vero Bible Fellowship for five years to join you in this wonderful work that you started. And uh, Lord, at times uh, we have felt like a nomadic people moving from one location to the other. But God, you are faithful and you're good, and we give you thanks for that. And we pray that you would now, in the weeks to come, as we learn more about this this endeavor and this property, that we would all make that deep commitment to you, to be faithful to you, and to participate with our gifts and abilities, and that, that we would be able to experience your hand at work in our midst. And never for our sake alone, but for the community of Vero Beach, that, Lord, we would be a church that would truly be a lighthouse in this community, a church that would, uh, 
that would go out in outreach and minister to those who are disenfranchised, those who are in need, that we would be a church that shares the gospel every single day as we go to our place, our sphere of influence, and that this would be a church that would bring honor and glory to your name and your name alone, in Jesus' name. And Lord, for this message, open our hearts and our eyes to see what you have put in the text for us to understand. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to continue this focus on choosing to be a healthy family. And today, the focus is on parenting. And uh, those of you who have already raised your kids, don't think that you're off the hook. Uh, you still have a relationship, I hope, with your children, your adult children. And there are still things in this teaching that will, I think, minister to you and help you. The one thing I've noticed as I studied this text, the thing that stood out for me as I looked at the life of Isaac and Rebecca, is how much God's grace shows up. At every turn, God's grace shows up. And we're going to see that even today. Last week, Pastor Brenton took us to Abraham and Sarah as examples of how to have a healthy marriage based upon what the Apostle Peter said in his epistle in chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. That doesn't mean that Abraham and Sarah did not suffer consequences of terrible decision-making. But God's grace, again, was evident throughout their lives, and they learned from their lessons. So Abraham is called the father of the faith. And even though there were times when he was unfaithful to God, God still used him greatly. So before Abraham dies... His parting wish was that his son Isaac would be married uh, to the right woman and not marry a pagan. And so in Genesis 24, turn in your Bible to Genesis 24, it describes how Abraham sends his servant to his relatives to find a wife for Isaac. Think about that, sending your servant to the relatives to find a wife, okay? Okay. So obviously, this is back in the day before God brought down in the law that you cannot marry your relatives. That did become an issue. Incest is an issue today. But at this point in history, it's so new, the world is so new, man is so new, that the gene pool is clean. And there's no issue of marrying a relative. And so that's what he does. He he, he, he sends his servant to go find a wife for his son Isaac. So Isaac and Rebekah married and had twin sons, Esau and Jacob. However, they didn't pan out to be very good parents. And from their mistakes, we will learn many lessons about parenting. One thread that runs through, throughout their life as parents is how much God's grace shows up. Why? Because parenting needs grace. That should have been an amen from the parents in the room. Nobody is ready-made as a parent. <laughs> you need God's grace to parent your children well. And that's exactly what we see here. Uh, but here are some things that we should learn today from Isaac and Rebecca. And by the way, I've got way more notes on this study than I can possibly share in one message. So We'll just go a little ways here, and then we'll, we'll stop, and we'll come back next week, and we'll stay with the text. Uh, we're just preaching expositorily here, letting the Bible speak. Uh, and so uh, that's important, right? That we exegete the text. That, that means to exit out of the text what is in it, instead of eisegesis, which is to put into the text what I want it to say. Okay, and Scott Walker told me this week, he calls it narsegesis where it's, the text works the way I like it to work. No, no, it's exegesis. We're going to take out of it what's in there, but it's good stuff. So let me get, go ahead and give you the points that we're going to hit over the next two weeks, okay? Here they are. These are things that we can learn from Isaac and Rebecca. Number one, healthy families bring their problems to God. We learn that from Isaac and Rebecca. They actually practice that. Number two, healthy families don't play favorites. Let me say that again. Healthy families don't play favorites. Now let me tell you what's so hard in that when you have a blended family. That's tough. That's tough. 
and you need God's grace to help you because you're going to mess up. It's just the reality of it. Thirdly, <clears throat> healthy families don't put self-satisfaction ahead of honoring the Lord. They don't put self-satisfaction in front of honoring the Lord. Number four, healthy families want the truth more than they want to keep peace. Healthy families seek after truth more than keeping peace. And number five, healthy families never do wrong to do right. You don't do right by doing wrong. That's going to come out big. So let's go ahead and go as far as we can here for the next few minutes. Number one, healthy families bring their problems to God. Turn to chapter 25 and look, if you will, at verse 20. Genesis 25, 20. We are using selected passages that we will exegete because this is a focus on parenting. And so we're staying with the things that God brings out to us from the text about parenting. Number one, we see here uh, the, the, how they brought their problems to God. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, who, uh, to be his wife. Now that's a mouthful to talk about the wife, isn't it? So good grief. What woman would want to be known by all of that? Now, verse 21, and Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Okay, so uh, this is a very interesting point. Very quickly, we learn what, we, what we're to do when we have a problem within our marriage, okay? Number one is in a healthy home, we bring that problem to God. That's the first thing we do. Then we seek other counsel. Then we seek the counsel of believers. Then we seek the book to read, or we seek the counselor to 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 sit under. But the first thing that any healthy family in the Lord will do is take the problem to God. You'd be surprised how many times somebody will come to me and say, I've got this problem, and, and I just want to know if you can help me with this. And uh, uh, the first thing I'll ask, uh, have you prayed about this before God? You'd be surprised how many people said, well, no, not really, not yet, because I wanted to come to you first. No, 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 no. I have no clue how to handle your problem. Only the Lord has the answer for you, ultimately. Amen? I mean, he's the one who has foreknowledge. He's the one who's in control. He's the sovereign God. You take your problem to God. Verse 22, and the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebecca, his wife, conceived. That's powerful. Why does it always look so easy in the Bible? They have a problem that she can't bear children. They pray, and all of a sudden, bada-boom, bada-bing, she's pregnant. She gets and she has a kid. If we study the text more, however, you will find that the Bible's not trying to draw this beautiful picture, how you pray it, and it happens right away. No, no, no. The Bible gives a totally different picture. So I want you to look at verse 26. Afterward, his brother, uh, ch chapter 25, verse 26. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. This is talking about the birth of the two boys. So his name was called Jacob. Look at this now. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore those two boys. They were 40 when they started praying. 20 years they prayed. And here's what it says. And the Lord granted his prayer. Wait a minute. If he started praying when he was 40, why didn't the Lord grant the prayer then? I don't know. You'll have to take that up with God. He's the one that is sovereign. He's the one that has a plan in everything. That's another thing about healthy parenting. You learn to trust God. And more than just trust him, you trust his timing for things. That's really what it's about. I don't have any answers for you on that, but God does. And you just got to, sometimes God doesn't tell you why. You just have to go with it. You have to trust him because he is God. We will never live a full life as believers in Christ if everything happens in our timetable. Just know that. 
as a believer, you'll never live a full life in Christ if everything has to happen in your timetable. If you're going to get frustrated because God's not doing it your way, you're just revealing how little you know about God. Let me help you here. Let me help you know a little more, those of you who are frustrated by these things. So here you are in this moment of history, and in this moment, I need God to do this. And I'm praying and saying, God, here's what we need from you. First of all, we don't tell God what to do, right? He's God. We can ask of him, but we should always ask according to his will. So here we are in this moment of history, we're asking, God hears it. Look, God doesn't live in this moment of history. God lives in this moment and every other moment. God is not bound. He's a spirit. He's not bound by time or space. You say, okay, well, I get that, but that doesn't help me. Okay, let me help you. You're at the corner of an intersection where there's a parade, and you're standing on the corner, and you can see the band, the first band of the parade coming, and then all of a sudden, they're in front of you. You could see out a little ways where they were coming. Now they're in front of you. In just a few moments, they're going to be beyond you, but now you see something else. You see the floats. You see whatever it is, you know. You only see a little part. What does God see? The whole parade at once. And everything behind the parade and everything in front of the parade. God has foreknowledge. He has understanding. He is omnipresent. He's all, always present in everything. You can never get away from the Lord. And so you have to trust that God for the decisions of your life, even when it goes against everything in your being. I want an answer now. Well, it's not time. I remember way back in the day when we were just young pastors and we had a lady in our church, her name was Cindy, and she was watching all the women in the church have babies. We had a church filled with young people and all these girls were getting pregnant and she was just, man, so frustrated and praying and we were praying. The whole church came and prayed over her on a Wednesday night, Bible study night. We just did everything we could to pray that she would have a, no baby. And so... Uh, out of frustration, she'd watch how the others were raising their kids and just longing, pining for her own child. And, and along the way, she would also get a little, you know, critical of them. Well, if that was my child, I would not do that. <laughs> Ladies, you've never done that, have you? No. Okay. So, so we're just praying and waiting, and years go by, and all of a sudden, she's pregnant. And then after she delivers, she's pregnant again. And after she delivers, she's pregnant a third time. All in the Lord's timing. I don't know why. And I also don't think that God is against us when we go seek medical help to understand why we're barren. He's the one that gave us the mind to understand how to study the human body. Did he not? Some doctors and folks know what they're doing i don't have a clue but they do and so there's many ways but you don't start with that you start with prayer before the lord and then you rest in him that my god knows my request he knows where i'm at i, I just need to rest in that that's what we have to do why because the prayer isn't so much about the change that we're seeking the prayer is the practice of me changing as I come before the Lord. I might start out in prayer demanding what he, that he do this. Lord, I just need, here's what we're, here's what we're doing here. Lord, if, just pay attention for a second. I know you're busy, and I've worked on this, and this is what we need from you. And then time goes, and he doesn't answer. And all of a sudden, I get to a point where now I'm saying, Lord, are you even wanting me to do this? What's your plan? How, how can I join you? Now, what did prayer change? It didn't change the situation. It changed me. That's why you pray every day, parents, church family. That's why we pray. Because God's is, he's in the business of changing us more than he is giving us what we think we need. Here we have limited understanding, but we're making these big requests like we know everything. It makes us look foolish. God knows everything. And he works it in his timing. Amen. Okay, let's move on. 
So she went, verse 22, or verse, yeah, verse 22, the children struggled together within her, and she said, if, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So Rebecca somehow felt something wasn't right within her, but without the 3D ultrasound, who do you, what do you do, you know? So verse 22, latter part, so she went to inquire of the Lord. Does this sound like a broken record? It's not. It's God's greatest hit. The bottom line is, you take things to God, you inquire of him, and leave it with him. Trust him. And watch God move in a way that only he can move. That's exactly what this, the fact that we today could make an announcement about a property that we're under contract with, that is all God. If you just know the story, and we'll tell more maybe next week, you, you, it'll blow you away. You'll know this is God. And I wouldn't want it any other way, amen? All right, so when you have a problem, take it to God. Bring your people, problems, and projects to God. And don't do it alone. When it's important, you want to bring it before your whole family. If you want to do family well, you want to have a healthy family, families pray together. I know you've heard that before, but that's, you know, people always play that down. Like it's the last thing we need to do. Okay, it's the last thing on the list. Well, now let's pray. There's nothing left to do. Let's just pray. Are you kidding? It's the greatest thing you can do. I, I was thinking about this myself. And so let me ask you this question. How many times in the last year did you gather as a family to pray over a matter? This is the behavior of a healthy family. The Christian life is a walk of faith. So we trust God through our issues, through our problems, through our projects, through the relational issues that can develop in a home. And by the way, if we're not praying together, our kids are learning something. You are all, as a parent, this is why grace is so important for parenting. You are always teaching your children, and it's not just when you speak. It's by what they see how you behave. If, if, if they never see you seeking God for the family's issues, what are you teaching your kids? You're teaching that when they grow up, they need to handle the family issues. And that's how a lot of parents live. We can fix that. We'll fix it. Let me just give you a little rundown here. This is how intricate prayer was to our family when my kids were little. They're all grown up. They're all adults. They all have kids, and I'm thankful for that. But we brought our adult problems many times to our children for prayer. My, my, I, that, we're not special. My father, who's sitting over here, he's 90 years old. When he was a little boy, his father, a farmer, came down with rabbit fever was down to skin and bones, very tall man, Charles, but yet he was very ill. He was going to die. And so at church on a Sunday, Grandma Dunn, my dad's grandma, came up to his mom and said, I really believe we need to gather together this, this afternoon as a family at the home and let's pray for Charles. God's going to heal him. They all gathered and they all prayed. They came out of prayer as a family. And my, gra my grandpa, his dad, said, I think I'd like to have a ham sandwich. <laughs> he hadn't eaten for weeks. He ate the ham sandwich. And after he ate it, he looked to his wife and he said, would you mind making one more for me? He had two ham sandwiches. But now... God's always in control, right? So listen to this. He had made a vow before God when he was dying. Father, if you will save me from this, I will follow you in the calling that you've given me. And he became a pastor. God's always working, and he works through the most difficult of circumstances. But he has a plan. What he needs is for us, the family, to join him in it. 
We are not to command God. We are to join God. God's the one that has the plan, right? Amen? Scripture says many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord's plan prevails. Let me give you another one. I took a family burden to my Wednesday night prayer group at church. We were told to abort the baby in Rini's womb. And we didn't know anything about this child. We just know that the, the, the specialist from UCLA who just moved to Palm Beach County was saying we should abort. It's, it's too risky, this child, and there's issues going on. There, it could be this, that, and the other. We looked at her like she was a three-headed monster. I said, we're not going to abort a child, a baby. We went home, fell prostrate on the carpet, cried out to God, not to fix whatever problems the baby had. Father, prepare us for what you're doing. And whatever it means, prepare us to be good parents. I shared that with my Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. Nora Means, 80 plus years old, came up to me afterwards and said, I'm going to be praying specifically for this situation. On Sunday morning, that next Sunday morning, three days, four days later, she walks up and said, Pastor, uh, I've been praying since Wednesday. And last night, in the middle of the night, I broke through. I broke through. And she said, uh, it's a boy, he's healthy, and he will go on to do great things for God. And I have a son today. And when he was a boy, he led the neighborhood boys to Jesus Christ as a kid. And he has a son now, little Ivor. God is good. God is faithful. The question is not, is God faithful? The question is, will we be faithful to God? Prayer will help you become faithful to God. Pray. We had a family problem with a roof that was leaking in our home in Palm Beach Gardens. It was one of those concrete roofs, you know. We huddled up with our children and prayed. Well, I remember sitting in the living room praying, and we, we asked God to take care of the problem, to fix the problem. Hey, folks, I could have gone out and had somebody do it. I could have taken care of that, but I wanted to teach my kids to trust the Lord. And so we prayed. It was a week later, I get a call from a man I've never met. His name was Ed Campany. He had a roofing company. He said, uh, I was praying, my wife and I were praying, and the Lord said that he wanted us to bless you. I said, how do you even know me? He said, that's not important. But the Lord revealed that to me. And he said, so what color do you want your roof to be? And I'm going to give, go get three bids, and I'm going to significantly come in way under whatever they tell you. I was like, wow. Now I'm thinking, I, I need to pray more often. This is really good stuff. We're not, play, we're not praying enough. A week later, he had a big job, and he said, we'll be back in a couple weeks, and we'll, we'll meet with you, and we'll, we'll get, get everything worked out. He calls back a week later, hey, pastor, we, we finished this job early that we were on, and the Lord really blessed us in that job. So I talked to my wife, we prayed, and the Lord said, he really wants to bless you. I said, what? He said, yeah. You're not paying anything for that roof. God's going to take care of that. Whew. The next Saturday morning, there were 13 men on my roof, banging and clanging and taking off concrete brick and getting that thing ready. I gathered my kids on Saturday morning in the living room with Rini, and we sat there holding hands in a circle while banging is going on. It said, this is what the Lord did. My kids saw from the beginning to the end what prayer does in a family. Healthy families pray over the matters with their children. I could go on and on. We had a van situation, and, or we needed a van. We would always had a car, and we, now we had more kids than we could put in the car. Lord uh, brought the kids in, sat down. Father, if you could just open the door for us. Picked up the paper, looked in the help wanted ads, and found that there was a van up in... Toy, uh, a Toyota up in uh, uh, Stewart, Florida, 
And I called the guy up thinking, man, you know, this, this is probably, it's already gone because it's a good, good car. And he answered the phone. I, he said, no, we've been out of town for a week. We didn't even know. You're the first person we talked to. We've been praying now, okay? So we drive up there. We look at it. It's in perfect condition, two years old. This guy trades. He's a, he's a retired dentist, I believe it was. He traded his vehicles in every two years. And he says, well, uh, what do you think? I said, I think it's wonderful. It'd be perfect, but I, I, I probably can't afford this vehicle. I didn't realize it was in this kind of shape. And he said, well, well uh, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a, I'm a pastor. He said, okay. He says, well, what do you think it's worth? Why don't you look it up and tell me what you think it's worth? So I said, okay. We walked away. I looked it up. I got the fair market value, came back, and I came down just a little under fair market value, and I said, this is what I'm willing to pay for it. And I, it was a sweet deal for that vehicle. And he said, or his wife answered the phone. So what it, here's what she said. So what would you decide? How much is it worth? I said, well, I think it's worth a lot more than I'm asking, but this is what we can afford. She goes, great, it's yours. Now, how many deals have you done for vehicles like that? You ever had a salesman at a car dealership come approach you that way? What do you think it's worth? Great, let's go. That's good. Let's, 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 let's do the deal. That, that's God. We prayed. So men, be the spiritual leaders of your home. Circle up with your family and bring it to God. Let the kids see that this is a family. My dad trusts God. Okay, don't, don't, you don't want to teach your kids they can trust you alone. You're not the answer. You're very limited. God's not. You want your kids learning to trust God. Verse 23, we're going to close her down in a minute here. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Now, that's a contrary way of thinking because the custom in biblical patriarchy was that the oldest son enjoyed the privileges of, pre of precedence in the household, and at the father's death, he would receive a double portion of what all the other children received. Okay, God declared to Rebecca, in listen now, in his sovereign election. Election is a biblical word. You can't ignore it, guys. It's there. And, and God declares to Rebecca in his sovereign election who he chose to bless. He chose the younger to be the one who out of him would come the nation of Israel. In fact, that's, that name came from the name of her son. So when her days, verse 24, to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body was like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. So here's a second point, and we're not going to get all the way through this one, but we'll just share a little bit of it. Number two, healthy families don't play favorites. Okay, so the first one comes out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his... That's pretty tough, tough stuff. To be named after the first thing they see of your physical attribute. Okay, can you imagine that? Uh, I'm glad my mom didn't apply that Old Testament practice when I was born because she said I came out looking like a rat with a pointed head. <laughs> Who knows what my name is? I've got an uncle on her family, her youngest, younger brother, youngest brother. And his name, that's all I've ever known him at, Pudgy. <laughs> but here's the deal. He's not fat. For most of his life, he was really skinny. But they called him Pudgy. That's brutal. But he, he got used to it. No big deal. Well, this is what it's like here. And then Jacob comes out. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 year, years old when she bore these boys. Jacob means heel catcher. He came out holding the heel of his older brother. Heel catcher. Also manipulator. And you're going to see that as we go forward next week. Verse 27, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. 
It's interesting how from the same parents you can have kids so diversely different. Isn't that true? No two kids born are alike coming out of the same womb. So Esau was like Stephen Ranella, a meat eater. He's out there in the woods hunting and bringing in the, 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 the meat. He's the ultimate outdoorsman, while Jacob was like Mr. Rogers. He enjoyed wearing his mother's sweaters that she knit together. Mr. Rogers, by the way, was a pretty cool dude. I mean, he's a good man. Amen? He was a pastor. It's just that he was not an outdoorsman. He was not a hunter. That was not him. Two good kids, totally different. The father liked the tough-skinned, hairy-chested hunter son, while the mom loved the tender-hearted son who had great communication skills. Look what it says here, verse 28. Here's the major problem in this family with this, these parents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. That's just wrong. Talk about unhealthy. And as you see this story unfold, you see how that little favoritism plays out in a big way and causes great damage in that family. And I know it's hard. It's hard not to favor maybe one child. Maybe it's the youngest child, and so they're the last one. And I understand that. Or they're the first child. And so there's all kinds, or there's certain things. One child has physical issues, and so we favor I'm just saying this is why we need God's grace because favoritism is not healthy for the whole family. It's not. Kids suffer when parents pick favorites. Don't do it. Don't, you'll be tempted to do it. Don't do it. My wife and I decided from day one we will not favor certain children. We will be fair because truly we love each one uniquely. I didn't pick the ones that were most like me. I love all my children for what they bring to the table. And every one of them is unique and special in the eyes of God. So important that we not play favorites. The, the problem is not that the boys were different. The problem was that each parent preferred one. I remember when Andy was born, our youngest, she was our fourth, and uh, my grandmother was still living at that time, and she was a great help to us with all of our kids, but she said to me one day after Andy was just a few months old, she said, so you're going to raise a grandchild. Let me tell you what she meant by that. Grandparents treat children, grandchildren, different than parents treat children. She was saying, you're a parent, and this little girl is going to need you to be a parent to her. Do not become a grandparent to her. Wisdom. Wisdom. What was Abraham's problem? He was a grandparent in age when he finally had Isaac, and he was tempted to treat Isaac more softly. This is the thing we have to be careful of. Playing favorites is unhealthy and dysfunctional. It's destructive. As parents, we are to love each child unconditionally, love the assertive, rambunctious child the same as the easygoing, compliant child. Love the self-confident child the same as the dependent child. Love the strong, healthy child the same as the physically challenged child. By God's grace, Love each of your children the same. I want to stop here. We'll pick up with the third of these different points next week. We'll continue this. But I would like for us to, to have an opportunity to pray and to reflect on what, what we're learning here today. What is God saying to you through his word today? It's different for each of us. God's word is different for each of us. Not that the word's different, but we're all in different places, and so the word speaks subjectively. And so you're the subject. What is God's word saying to you? 
You can, be in a, you can be an older adult whose kids now are grown up and moved out of the house, and you can still play favorites. You can still not pray with your adult children and pray for them. There's nothing wrong with, from a long distance, as your child shares what they're facing right now, some of the realities of, of the difficulties they face, and say, you know, before we get off the phone, I do want to come back to that, and I'd like to pray with you about that. You, ne you never stop praying, not only for your kids, but with your kids. Amen? We, we huddle up regularly. It's a regular practice for us as a family when we have gatherings for like birthdays or whatever is to speak the things that are encouraging to each person on their special day and pray together. We pray at all of our meals. We, it's just important to us. It's a value. So today, I want you to stand. Everyone stand, if you would, please. And I want you to reflect upon God's word. And what is God saying? Forget about the things I said, but what is the Lord by the Holy Spirit? And just what is he enlightening you to? What does he seem to be focusing you on right now? And I want to invite the prayer partners to come up, and also the, the elders, please. Come and stand spread out so you're not standing next to each other. And I want to give you an opportunity to come up and to pray. But you don't have to go to a prayer partner. If you want, just come and stand right here. And I would like to pray for the parents of our church. And every single one of you that are parents, I know you face issues. I'd love the, the privilege of praying for you. And you say, well, why don't you just pray for us from the place where we're standing? I want you to step out. Because you're saying, I need this. And you're not ashamed to say, I need prayer as a parent. There's something about the Lord blessing us because we humble up in front of him. Because we need him. If that's you, I want you to step out now and come and just stand across. If you have a special request that's private, personal, please go to one of our, our prayer partners and they will pray with you about that, okay? But the rest of you, please come who are parents. And you could be a 70-year-old parent and you need prayer for your children. Let's make this a point of prayer. Let's bring our families before the Lord. We're not against parents, we're for parents because we all are parents. <laughs> and most of us here have done some parenting at some time. It might not even been your child, but God gave you a, a responsibility for somebody else. You know how much we need this, amen? And can some of us, and I'll come down and come around this way so that those further back can come on up. Thank you, thanks so much. never too old to seek God as parents. Never. And none of us have all the answers, but he does. So let's seek him right now. Let's seek the Lord. Father, this morning we come before you and we think about those passages in the Bible, passages that tell children to obey their parents in the Lord, for this is right. But we also see the passage that says, fathers, don't exasperate your children. We can so easily do that. Sometimes we don't even realize we're doing it. Father, today we come humbly before you, parents of all ages, some with small children, some with infants, some with grown adults who now have their own children. And we're asking you, Father, as parents, that you would just look upon us and you would show your grace to us because we've all made mistakes in parenting. Everybody has. We're asking for you to show your grace. Lord, remind us that you are a grace-giving God. You'll always give us another opportunity to get it right. That's how much you love us. And I pray that, Father, we would understand that. But then also, Lord, that you would equip us by your word, the things that even we've looked at today and the things that we're going to look at next week, and then in our own personal study as we study the Bible, that we would glean and we would learn. We'd be committed to know what it looks like 
to be a healthy family from God's perspective. Father, help us with that. Help us with that. Help us to know, Lord, how to show love to our children equally. Help us to understand the importance of praying with our children regularly. Give us the, the, the fortitude. Give us the, 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 the assertiveness. Some need assertiveness. Lord, give us the, the, the importance, the value of prayer. Let us see it fresh and new. Let us know that the prayers that we pray, whether we get the answer when we want or not, doesn't matter. You're still in control. You're still at work. But one thing's for sure. The more we pray, the more we will change. And that's probably where you want to begin is changing us. Let our kids see that change in us. Let them see, Mom, Dad, they're not the same. Something's happening. They see more of a reliance upon you, Father. The children now begin to understand what it means, what the, the, the focus or the, the, the purpose of prayer in the family. Oh, God, help us. And again, Father, you're not a God to condemn us by your word. You are a God to convict us. May that conviction bring forth a sweetness in our homes among our children a sweetness as a parent, as it, for those who are single parents, oh, even more grace that they need because they're alone in it. And those who are couples that are parenting, Father, may we look at each other differently through these moments of prayer. Just may it strengthen us to be healthy. That's what we desire. Choose you this day, Joshua said, whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let that be all of our prayers today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Praise God. Well, let's come back next week, and we'll share more about uh, this message on parenting, but we'll also learn a little bit more and maybe have some pictures for those of you who don't drive out to 82nd Avenue, show you what the church looks like from the outside. Uh, by the way, nine and a half acres and filled with oak trees, beautiful oak trees. When our team went out there, every time we've gone, we've walked away going, we have such a sense of peace on these grounds. And so praise God. He's at work. God bless you. Thanks for being here.